Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar today on the, AP, the ABCs of the EU GDPR and what you need to know. We're going to wait a few more minutes uh, to give people a chance to join us and then we'll start the webinar. Our presentation today uh, will be together with um, uh, Compliance and Technology Lawyer from Quartery, uh, Jonathan Armstrong, who is uh, an expert on the topic, and he's going to talk about an introduction to GDPR, what it is, who it applies to, uh, what are some of the things to consider, and then uh, we will also hear from Tufin CMO Pat Walsh about the general challenges of compliance and how TUFIN can specifically help where it comes to preparing for GDPR. So that's going to be our session today. Uh, we're going to um, accept questions all throughout the webinar, so if you have a question, feel free to click on the questions button and you can type in your question. We will leave time to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. So uh, you can enter your questions, questions throughout the session and then we'll have time to answer them at the end. We also have an attachment for this webinar. The attachment is a TUFIN white paper on how to survive um, Enterprise Security Policy Compliance, and the six steps that TUFIN offers for compliance, for continuous compliance. So uh, at any time, you can download the attachment for this webinar as well. Okay, so let's wait one more minute. Again, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today on this webinar. Okay, I think we're, uh, we're almost ready to start. Today's webinar is focused on the ABCs of the EU GDPR. GDPR has been uh, in the headlines uh, since the deadline was, um, was scheduled for next year. And we wanted to have this opportunity to present an introduction to GDPR which will be presented by Jonathan Armstrong, Compliance and Technology Lawyer from Quartery at, in the UK. And um, co-presenting is Pat Walsh, TUFIN CMO, to talk about the challenges around continuous compliance and how TUFIN can help um, in your preparation for complying with GDPR. So we're going to, to get started. Um, I'm just going to introduce our presenters today. Jonathan Armstrong is an experienced lawyer with a concentration on technology and compliance. His practice includes advising multinational companies on matters involving risk, compliance, and technology across Europe. He has handled legal matters in more than 60 countries involving emerging technology, corporate governance, ethics code implementation, reputation, internal investigations, marketing, branding, and global privacy policies. Jonathan has counseled a range of clients on breach prevention, mitigation, and response. Jonathan qualified as a lawyer in the UK in 1991 and has focused on technology risk and governance matters for more than 20 years. Jonathan was recently ranked as the 14th most influential figure in data security worldwide by Onalytica in their 2016 data security top 100 influencers and brand survey. Jonathan will present an introduction to GDPR, which will be followed by a drill down into specific challenges of regulatory compliance in enterprise IT teams. This section will be presented by TUFIN CMO Pat Walsh. Pat has over 25 years of experience in the IT infrastructure software industry, 
specializing in building strategies that have accelerated growth and created strong market positions for his previous companies. Prior to joining Tufin, Pat was head of marketing at Core Security, which was acquired by Kurian, where he specialized in identity access and vulnerability management solutions that minimize cyber risks and maintain continuous compliance with security standards. And with that, I want to hand it over to uh, our first presenter, uh, Jonathan. Please go ahead. Thanks so much, Maya, and thank you for stepping into the breach at short notice. Um, we're hoping that you won't notice we've had a number of uh, challenges in putting this uh, webinar together today. I'm in Gibraltar long, uh, for longer than I'd initially anticipated. So if you hear the screech of birds or monkeys in the background, I do apologize. But that perhaps illustrates one of the fundamental themes that Maya's touched on with GDPR, in that it is all embracing and certainly the headline news, even in relatively remote places like Gibraltar, there was a large conference that I spoke at on GDPR yesterday. It was headline news on the TV station here and was attended by both the Governor and the First Minister of Gibraltar who were there to tell businesses locally that they must uh, ensure that they're complying and it's their biggest compliance challenge of the year. And that's not limited to the remoter jurisdictions. I've attended a similar event in Ireland where again the Minister Responsible and the Data Protection Commissioner were both, uh, were both there as well. So you can't underestimate the importance that GDPR has on uh, this side of the Atlantic, certainly, and increasingly in the U.S. and in North America as well, for reasons that I'll uh, explain later. But I thought it was helpful before we sort of set off on our journey of looking at GDPR, I thought it would be useful to just have a little bit of situation analysis in where we are at the moment. Well, obviously, personal data has a value. There have historically been different political reactions to things like data breach and information security incidents worldwide. What's tended to happen is that government has lost a large amount of data and then has regulated the private sector more, uh, you know, more consequentially as a result. But I think that there are a number of climactic uh, things that have changed that in recent years. First of all, I think we've seen a different uh, approach on enforcement, both within Europe and between Europe and the US. So traditionally, Europe concentrated on data protection legislation. That's legislation to as I say, is protect better personal data, whereas the U.S. has tended to concentrate on after-the-event type regulation. So if you have a data breach, then you must report it. What we've seen, I think, over the last five years or so is an increasing trend for some U.S. states to look at data protection type legislation. So not only HIPAA and GLB across the U.S., but also uh, states like Massachusetts and California that are introducing legislation that looks a bit like our data protection legislation. And at the same time, some in Europe have become fans of data breach legislation. So what we're seeing is that instead of it being an either-or situation, e you know, either notification laws or data protection laws, we're seeing both take place. And just as a very uh, basic ground rule, the other difference, I think, between... Europe and the U.S. commonly, is that U.S. statutes tend to have a definition of PII, you know, what is personally identifiable information. And one of the big mistakes I think that people make is thinking that PII is the same as personal data, and it really isn't. Personal data in Europe is, has a much broader definition. It's basically any data that can uh, identify, can identify a, a living individual. And I'm stressing can because even if you strip out the name of the person, for example, or even if you don't know it initially, that still could be personal data. So as an example, if you're, if you're my employer and you've got details on me and you strip out my name, but you still have an employee number, then that's personal data as well. And if you only ever know my IP address, but you can find out who I am by resolving that IP address, say it's a static IP address, then that's also personal data. 
And that's probably not changed under GDPR. It depends on which country you're looking at. But GDPR certainly put the emphasis on all of these other bits of data we have about people being personal data. So the scope of the legislation in Europe tends to be much more broad than some of the U.S. data breach statutes as well. The Snowden allegations about the activities of the NSA have certainly changed the game. In some parts of mainland Europe, like uh, Germany, Austria, for example, the activities of U.S. corporations have been treated with much more suspicion, not only by uh, employees, but also by, by customers. And the Schrems litigation, for those of you who haven't, uh, who, who followed it, has certainly had a real impact. And uh, there's more details on our website if you're not familiar with the Schrems litigation. But in short, this is the litigation that struck down the safe harbor agreement for transferring data out of the EU to the US. Switzerland followed uh, uh, as well shortly afterwards in, in, in abandoning its safe harbor program. But Switzerland and the EU have replaced safe harbor with a scheme called Privacy Shield. I don't think that has a long-term future in its current state. Uh, Schrems has uh, a couple of other pieces of litigation currently as well. One, a class action against Facebook for the way in which allegedly it handled data on citizens in Europe. And the second, an action which is progressing still in the Irish courts to strike out uh, standard contractual clauses. So just note that data transfer is always a challenging situation in Europe, and that's influenced in some respects GDPR and the new regime. And then the other thing that I'm going to talk about a little bit climactically is the fact that in many respects GDPR is already a reality. Even in the UK where the legislation hasn't changed, the regulator has a weather eye on GDPR each time and will set a tough bar. So, for example, just this week they have taken uh, proceedings against a local authority that didn't patch vulnerabilities quickly enough and they've leveled a fine and they said even though you were hacked, you could have prevented that hack if you'd had a better awareness about your network, what it was doing, where its vulnerabilities were. So we are seeing a tougher barrier, almost like a GDPR burden of proof, uh, come across Europe. And I'm going to talk about a, a few other aspects where, where GDPR is already a reality a little bit later as well. So... Uh, what is the current legislative background? Well, that's pretty simple. It's more or less the same across most of uh, the EU currently. In the UK, it's um, Principle 7 of the Data Protection Act. In Gibraltar, it's uh, identical, word for word. And in some other parts of Europe, the, the legislation says more or less the same. You can see it on the screen in front of you. Appropriate technical and organizational measures need to be taken to protect data. And remember, just as an aside, that that covers manual data as well as electronic data. Obviously, we're going to concentrate on electronic data, but always have in mind the fact that maybe 20% of the breaches we see are, uh, are manual data. Maybe it's helpful if I explain a little bit about the context of how we get involved in these cases. So uh, as, as a firm, we specialize in, in these matters. We do work in three areas, so, so policies, procedures, preventative type measures, secondly, training, thirdly, responding to incidents. So we're probably handling, I would estimate, about four uh, breaches a week at the moment. Many of them aren't reportable under the current legislation, but obviously most have got to be investigated. And that's certainly a huge increase, I think, since uh, in the last two or three years. And because organizations are identifying more breaches and they're handling more breaches, regulators have also looked at how they do that. So you'll see on the screen, the um, advisory words from the Dutch Information Commissioner, where they're saying not only do you have to have a contingency plan to deal with breaches, but you have to rehearse it. So the mindset we need to have is a little bit like fire evacuation plans. We have to have a plan, we have to rehearse it, we have to tell our people what happens when the alarm rings. And the other thing that I think is very helpful is I see a lot of data breach plans that are too long. 
and often they're very technical documents that talk about, you know, open ports or how they're going to deal with different attack vectors. That isn't the plan that you want to be giving the whole populace in your business. What you need, I think, are two plans, if you like. I'm sitting uh, in a hotel room, as I said, in Gibraltar at the moment. On the back of my hotel door, there's a very straightforward plan that tells anyone who comes into the organization, this is how you get out, this is how you raise the alarm, and this is what you do next. And we need a data breach plan like that in an organization that just has basic details of how to identify a potential breach and then says, talk to somebody who knows more about this than you. Just as the back of my hotel bell, uh, door says, raise the alarm, then you're done. We'll ask you more stuff if we need to, but your responsibility is at an end. And equally, I guess down in the reception, there'll be a more detailed folder that the duty fire officer will give to the fire brigade when they arrive or whatever. We need that same approach to data breach planning. And obviously, we need, just as we need fire alarms in the hotel, I can see one above my head at the moment, then we need proper technology to identify when there is a breach, to report that quickly, to raise the alarm and, and be, the, uh, be the call to action for everybody. So, um, Maya, before we go on to, the, uh, on to looking at GDPR and, and what that means, perhaps we could do uh, a short vote. Um, it would be really helpful, I think, to get the uh, extraterritorial uh, effect and people's understanding of, whether they're, um, of where they're based, and then we can tailor some of the remarks. So you'll see the first vote should be on the screen in front of you. Although GDPR is initiated by the EU, it applies to any multinational corporation that holds personal data about EU citizens. Where is your country's base of operations? So do uh, feel free to vote on that, and then, then that might help us uh, uh, gauge where, where we go with that. Shall I allow you, what, 10 seconds to vote, maybe? Yeah, so everyone, you, you should be able to see the vote on your screen asking you to tell us where your company is, is based out of. Um, uh, just so, again, we, could, uh, we can see, uh, you know, the, the different areas that are interested in, G in the GDPR and in compliance with GDPR. So we'll give it a few more seconds, uh, and then we'll close the survey. I think we've got 31 votes so far, Mayor. Well, should we have a quick look at the results then? Yes, I think we can, uh, we can take a look at the results. So, um, we, we see that the majority of, uh, of you are from um, the European Union countries, although we have 40% of participants from the United States and the Americas. So it really, I think it, um, it does show that uh, we're dealing with a, a, a regulation that is relevant worldwide and doesn't just apply to the EU. Jonathan, do you want to comment on that? No, I, I think that's a very helpful vote, and I think obviously uh, most of people within the EU have been concentrating on, on GDPR for some time. My sense is that those outside the EU have concentrated a, a little bit later along, uh, and, and maybe I'll build some, uh, something into my next remarks about how I think there's a particular challenge for businesses outside of the EU, given that that's about, I guess, 40% of our population. So uh, maybe if I move on to looking at some of the rules around GDPR, it's important to say that it's a pretty long document. It's some 88 pages long, so we won't be able to cover all of that today. But I thought I'd set out some of my highlights, if there is such a thing. Uh, 
and look at those in three distinct areas. So aims, benefits, and consequences. So the, the ABCs, if you like, of GDPR. So first of all, what's GDPR trying to set out, to set out to do? Well, it's proposed that uh, as a regulation and not a directive. So the regulation's passed. We passed that a year or so ago. We've got about a year to go, this two-year grace period to get people to get, uh, uh, help people to prepare. And why I say it's a proposed regulation, not a directive, is a rather technical thing. So a directive, uh, like the old EU data protection legislation, is the opposite of what you would think it would be. A directive isn't of direct effect. So a directive is an instruction to nation-state governments, so those different countries in the EU, to tell them to do something. Whereas a regulation is a law that should be uniform across the whole of the EU. The problem with GDPR is that there are what's called derogations, allowing each country in the EU to set some of its own rules. And depending how you calculate it, there are maybe around 50 derogations. So the most common, for example, is each nation state can set its own rules on when a child isn't a child uh, for some of those aspects of GDPR around consent, etc. But the difficulty, I think, with GDPR is that some countries have taken the opportunity to update other bits of their data protection law at the same time. So in Germany, for example, we now have their, uh, their legislation on the statute book, which in some respects conflicts with the original ideas of GDPR. The deal, really, uh, between business and consumers in GDPR was that the system was streamlined for businesses in exchange for consumers getting more rights. And my worry is that that deal has become unequal, particularly if we're getting countries like Germany that are tweaking GDPR, uh, and, and, and the net net is that some uh, organizations will still have to be checking against local law, particularly over things like jurisdiction. So for those of you who aren't within the EU and, and are on the call, bear in mind the fact that if you host data, even if it isn't EU data on a German server, it's likely that you'll have to comply with GDPR-like legislation, even if your only connection is with a German server. And, and, and that, of course, isn't the regime under GDPR, and, and there are subtle differences there that we're going to have to look out for. What is true is that there are toughened enforcement bodies across the EU. There isn't going to be a centralized EU data protection police, as we've seen some people state, but there is a, a harmonization body that is effectively something called the Article 29 Working Party, this, this uh, meeting group of data protection regulators, but it has more powers than a statutory footing under GDPR. One of the important things to talk about is the fact that breach reporting in, uh, is introduced in 72 hours. So organizations will need to get much better, as I said, at getting their alert systems in place to find out when data has gone astray. So this fire alarm system I talked about. And having proper technology in place to do that will be key, not only to tell you when a breach happens, but also to tell you very quickly about the consequences of that breach. And so we're going to need to concentrate on some of the nitty-gritty, fine detail of breach reporting. To give you an example, I often find it difficult in a data breach for the business to get uh, us metrics on the breach in a way that will satisfy the regulator. Different regulators across Europe have different formats that they want breach reports to be made in. And whilst in some cases that the use of those formats isn't mandatory, if you can get details of the breach very quickly and sweat that data into different types of report, you'll be uh, able to, to manage a bit better, I think. Data protection impact assessments are another key part of GDPR, and they're connected in some respects with a principle called uh, data protection by design. So the whole idea really is that if you're doing something new, you do a business case looking at the risks and how you can mitigate them. So let's say, for example, you're introducing homeworking. 
and those home workers could have access to personal data, then you'll need to look at what the risks might be. So, for example, you might have a risk of uh, data getting lost in transmission or intercepted in transmission. And then you have to look at how you might mitigate those risks, for example, by putting some sort of encryption or file transfer type uh, software in place. And you have to go through that process for all of the risks that you identify and then mitigate them out. And you may need to consult, for example, if it um, involves employee data, you may need to consult with employees, works councils or their representatives. And the DPIA thing, I think, is at the heart of good GDPR compliance. It's this sort of risk assessment that really helps you uh, proceed. And I think they're going to be the things that regulators will concentrate on. As many of you will know, there are new audit powers under GDPR. So regulators can knock on the door of an organization and ask to see DPIAs. So having a good DPIA process in place and documenting that, I think, is going to be key. As we said already, suppliers outside of the EU are in scope. And in many cases, it becomes more difficult for suppliers outside of the EU. And here's another area of confusion, unfortunately. Some businesses have to appoint what's called a data protection officer, or DPO, who has a sort of advisory role. It's a very uh, detailed role. We've done some work on looking at specimen role profiles for a DPO, and the DPO's role is about five pages long in terms of their responsibilities under, under GDPR. But in addition, if I'm a business that's based outside of the EU, but I target EU citizens or I profile them or whatever, then I have to appoint a DPR, a data protection representative. And the DPO and the DPR aren't the same things. And the DPR can have liability if the non-EU organization uh, has a fine levied against it and doesn't pay it. The difficulty at the moment is that there are very few DPRs about and not that many people willing to accept the position because, of course, fines go up under GDPR. Uh, even a small company can be fined 20 million euros and there aren't that many qualified representatives in Europe willing to put their own houses on the line for somebody in that, in that situation. And then the other aim, I think, really, is to diminish the distinction between data processors and data controllers. And this has a number of consequences, really. I think we're seeing much more aggressive contractual negotiations as a result. And not only uh, that, but we're also seeing vendors have liability for the first time. And again, that couples with the greater fine. So to give you an example, we have a client who sells software to banks, they previously didn't cap their liability in their contract, but their maximum liability was £500,000. Under GDPR, they've just signed a deal with a bank where their liability is now $2.2 billion, with a B, euros. So there's this huge increase in liability, partly because of this, uh, this reduction uh, of, um, of distinction between processor and controller. So what are the benefits? Well, uh, here are some of the perceived benefits. Firstly, there's no general registration requirement. So in many countries, you used to have to register the collection of data with a centralized government authority. You shouldn't have to do that post May 2018. There's something called the one-stop shop. So the theory is that if you operate in multiple EU jurisdictions, you will have one regulator who's the lead regulator of your operations. I have doubts as to whether this is going to work in practice. I still think in areas like security breach, it could be very challenging in having to get the data together, but theoretically that system should exist. And we've got new rights for individuals, so consent is less of an option. Consent doesn't get abolished by GDPR, as some people say, but it's certainly tougher to get consent, particularly from employees. We've got new rights, like the right to be forgotten, the right to data portability, the right to objective profiling, which are going to cause real challenges, I think, for uh, CISOs and technology, uh, those involved in technology in terms of getting data identified quickly and disclosed to data subjects. 
And similarly, we have an enhanced subject access uh, request regime. So for those of you who haven't come across this before, and by the way, there's a glossary that we're going to give you at the end with some links, uh, that this is the right of individuals to see the data that an organization holds on them. And this could be used as a type of DDoS attack because we know that organizations take between 150 and 200 man hours to comply with SARs <coughs> and the option is there for, for pressure groups, for example, to drop 1,000 SARs at the same time and effectively create a DDoS attack. So, what are the consequences of all this? Well, we've touched at some of these already. Firstly, the fines increase. So, fines are up to 4% of global annual turnover. If you're a small business, 20 million euros instead. Um, there are shared investigations across the EU, obviously much greater reputational risk, and a greater shareholder and investor uh, engagement as a result. As I've said, in some respects, GDPR is already a reality. We have data breach reporting laws now in Germany, Austria, and the Netherlands, increased fines in places like the Netherlands, more right to be forgotten cases. This is the right, uh, one of these new rights that I mentioned of somebody to say, delete me from your system. It's also called the right uh, to erasure under GDPR. We've got um, new privacy policy codes in the UK, and we've also got the export of GDPR. I won't touch on this too much given the geographical spread of the people on this call uh, that we established in our vote, but bear in mind the fact that the countries that aren't in the EU, like uh, Japan and South Korea, are looking at, um, at, at incorporating bits of GDPR to get what's called an adequacy decision. And yesterday I had a chat with the Dead Protection Lead for one country that's already regarded as adequate by the European Commission. And obviously they're in a very advanced stage of their negotiations with the EU on getting that recognition carried across into the new regime. So what should your response be? Well, I'm going to rattle through some of my top tips before uh, I hand over to Pat, who's going to lead you through some solutions. But um, first of all, I'd say that you have to have a plan. Make sure that that plan is robust. You might want to do internal audits against that plan. You might be subject to external audit. You're certainly going to want to do uh, internal reviews. So have a plan, but don't make it too ambitious. I know that a lot of organizations are getting bogged down because their plans too uh, wide. They're concentrating on things like data mapping. Time is short. You haven't got long left to prepare. And, uh, and I think you need to be proportionate. For most businesses, we're saying they'll need to concentrate on maybe 8 to 12 actions initially and really put their effort behind areas like subject access requests, like data breaches, because that's the stuff that's going to get you into uh, the biggest uh, levels of fines, I think. So as I said, as part of your plan, make sure that you've got a proper data breach response plan. Look at the technology you'll need. Obviously, it needs to uh, help you with things like the records reporting obligations, with things like reporting of data breaches, et cetera, et cetera. So, you, so you're going to need to examine things like that. Review your vendor contracts. You'll need their help in dealing with uh, security breaches. Check you've got the right contract with them. Um, I've got a contract negotiation at the moment of a business that says that it sells threat intelligence but refuses to give any commitment to reporting when it has a data breach. Well, I don't think those two things connect at all. So hold vendors' hands to the fire, if you like, over their contracts, particularly the assistance they'll give you in dealing with a security breach. Put in place the DPIA process. Again, you might be able to get technology to help you assess those risks. You're going to have to do a proper, robust risk assessment, particularly when you do something new. Get your documents and records in order to produce an regulatory inspection. Factor these into overhead costs. Don't have them in complicated formats. Regulators like simple Word documents. They don't like, you know, Gantt charts or whatever. So make sure that you have a red folder in your office if you're responsible or whatever that you can hand to a regulator because first impressions count, I think. And if you look complex and, uh, and obtuse as an organization, then that doesn't get you off to the best advantage.
You need to uh, introduce or update your subject access request process as well. Again, as I said, a lot of time and resource will be spent here. Make, things, make sure that these new rights, consent, rights we've forgotten, et cetera, are covered in your policies and procedures. If you need one, appoint a data protection officer. Again, some complexity around the rules there, but uh, obviously we can answer that in, in Q&A if you like. Look at your public statements on compliance. If uh, GDPR is an unaddressed risk and you're a listed entity, you may need to start disclosing that in your accounts. Uh, look, uh, train your staff on all aspects of the law. We could talk about proper training for at least another two hours, but uh, suffice to say that that needs to be appropriate to the audience. Bite-sized chunks work, needs to be regularly refreshed. The regulator in the UK, for example, has said that any training over two years old that hasn't been refreshed doesn't count. Uh, set up and uh, undertake regular compliance audits or reviews. I'm more of a fan of reviews than, than, than strict audits, again, for reasons we can discuss in the Q&A if you like. But you do need some sort of process of working out where your risks are and whether they're robustly being resolved. And finally, I'd say sense check your plans with specialist lawyers, partly because that's a good idea, but partly because I've um, still got two daughters to get through college. And um, so with that, Pat, I think it's probably appropriate that I hand over to you. Obviously, for many businesses, there's a lot of work to be done. There's little time left, and a lot of people are struggling with the amount of resources that they've got. But are there any sort of technical solutions that might be able to help with that process, Pat? Yes. Uh, you know, of course, at Tufin, we believe uh, there are and that we have – uh, some solutions that could be a benefit to those organizations looking to comply uh, by the deadline next year um, for GDPR. First off, I want to thank you, Jonathan, for the uh, thorough and insightful uh, overview of uh, GDPR, the ABCs, and I think uh, the approach that you take and laying it out um, uh, definitively uh, and just having each of those steps uh, understood is uh, a real help to begin with. Um, but just to start off, uh, maybe to acknowledge the point that um, meeting compliance and regulation, uh, complying with regulations that are out there is challenging. Uh, what we see in our environment is that no organization has a, a simple uh, homogenous kind of set of uh, technologies. It tends to be messy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, different uh, technologies distributed, uh, typically globally, and that's where I think with this uh, uh, session we're seeing that uh, so many people outside of um, uh, the EU are uh, paying attention because uh, it does impact everybody uh, that does deal with data that um, you know may originate uh, in the EU, but uh, part of their multinational organization is a responsibility that they have. And there's so much regulatory um, compliance need out there that there is a fatigue set in, and any ability to kind of simplify or streamline the processes uh, are going to be beneficial to those trying to comply. And as mentioned uh, uh, earlier by yourself, um, resources are scarce uh, or at least are under pressure to uh, get a lot of things put into place in a short amount of time, uh, and they must because the penalties are severe. Uh, so you can see this uh, number here, uh, nearly 60% are seeing that they're going to have to staff up uh, in order to meet the regulatory requirements that they have within their organizations. No surprise there. Uh, so, you know, if we look at, you know, how it is that compliance can be met, uh, we like to call uh, continuous compliance uh, the holy grail of those that are trying to meet the regulations that are dictating their industries, uh, GDPR being one. And why we point that out is that uh, if you're just trying to meet audits or uh, any uh, audit around uh, uh, regulation that's uh, dictated for your industry on, say, a quarterly or six-month basis, what we've typically seen is there's a lot of buildup to the audit, uh, and then maybe the audit points out some things where you're out of compliance that you have to fix. There's a lot of time and effort that's put into that. Uh, if you could continuously determine as things change in your environment that based on policies that you've established uh, that uh, right out of the box uh, you're in compliance with those policies and any changes thereafter are also going to be checked against uh, uh, the policies that are in place to ensure compliance, that is what we refer to as continuous compliance and being ready uh, for audits at all times. Uh, that will streamline things and that will make uh, the effort associated with any audits 
minimized. And it will still keep you in compliance, but it will cost you a lot less when it comes to time and resources. So how do we get there? Well, uh, we like to talk about the uh, process for continuous compliance that we see our customers and organizations that are working with Tooth and Usen. And the first thing is um, define an enterprise security policy. So you must have one in place that spans the enterprise and is consistently enforced across the enterprise. And that's really the one piece of this entire process that Tufin doesn't involve ourselves in. That's something that uh, you as an organization, uh, to, based on uh, the risks and uh, benefits that uh, you would see from uh, certain aspects of your business, you have to balance that out. Um, it could be dictated by uh, regulations like GDPR. It could also be dictated by internal processes as set up by internal audit. Uh, it varies, and thus uh, it's really the responsible of all organizations to define their own enterprise security policy. Uh, after that, um, we focus on capturing uh, the network topology so that you can understand when it comes to security and the risks therein uh, that you have a, a firm understanding of what uh, is within your network infrastructure, how it's connected, what it's allowing in terms of degree of connectivity uh, between devices, but also the services that those devices are communicating with. Uh, Segmentation is important in the world of networking. Um, if you can segment uh, information and the uh, systems that carry that information, you can protect yourself from a varying degrees, uh, degree of, of risk. So you can, by using segmentation, you can ensure that uh, access to certain data is limited to only those individuals that should have access to it, and you can essentially wall it off from uh, those that should not have access. Um, next step up is, um, you know, any gaps that are now in place. So if you've gone through the exercise of understanding the existing topology, putting together uh, a segmentation strategy associated with the enterprise security policy, you can now identify the gaps that you have within your overall structure and infrastructure in order to comply with what you intended in your original policy. Uh, and with that, you can now make changes that will realign you with the policy that you had set up uh, initially. Uh, enforcement. Uh, it was raised earlier that uh, enforcement across the organization is important, and you need the well-defined processes in which uh, to ensure that your organization is complying at all times. And then, as we said, the preparation of audit. This can be streamlined and simplified if uh, you have the tools necessary to identify those things, namely how to identify changes that are being made, how to design changes that uh, are automatically complying with the policies that have been set in place so that you are putting in these changes uh, that are already uh, assuming that an audit will take place and that you would need to uh, comply with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, you repeat it uh, after uh, conducting the audit. You go back, you revisit uh, the enterprise security policy to ensure that uh, no changes are necessary there, and you repeat the, the process. So this is uh, what we refer to as uh, the ongoing process for continuous compliance. So if we look at, you know, ultimately what we're uh, providing uh, from a TUFIN perspective is uh, managing enterprise security policies across uh, very uh, varied uh, infrastructure elements. That could entail multi-vendor environments that you would have within your data, system, uh, data center and within your network. Uh, and you can see a list of popular vendors that we're supporting uh, on the network down below. Uh, you can see public cloud environments, and that uh, could be uh, provided by Amazon, Microsoft, Google, um, the provider of choice. There are also private cloud environments now that are becoming prevalent. Uh, we see Cisco with uh, uh, ACI and uh, VMware with NSX, for instance, um, supporting those. So there's a, a varied set of uh, infrastructural elements that you'll have, both on-premise and off-premise today. Uh, and what Tufin is providing is essentially a way in which taking a policy-based approach so that you could manage across that environment. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, this approach is specifically going to help you comply with uh, GDPR. And I guess the best way to go about it is to call out some uh, specifics of uh, GDPR itself and the articles that are associated with it. Um, the specific sections that uh, we're able to uh, help address 
are uh, listed here. So you can see under general obligations, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the specific article talking about data protection by design and default, uh, records of processing activities uh, under security of personal data, uh, how uh, you can meet the need for security of processing. And then finally, we'll talk about data protection impact assessments, uh, as was mentioned earlier by Jonathan, and specifically, uh, you know, what we're doing in that area. Uh, so, by way of example, um, Article 25, uh, talking about uh, how do you, by design and default, set up a way in which you're uh, having your organization think about data protection. Uh, you need to assure that you have all the appropriate technical and organizational measures in place uh, to protect that data. And as I referred to earlier, segmentation being popular in terms of how to limit access, uh, we have a solution that we call the Unified uh, Security Policy, and you see it modeled here. It's essentially a matrix that allows you to take your policy and identify which zones within your network can communicate which, with which other zones and using which services. And so this allows you then to identify where you may have excessive network access and thus reduce that. Uh, it'll also allow you to segment the entire network uh, from one centralized uh, area. So regardless of uh, the different technologies and environments you have, you have a, a single um, uh, pane of glass to look at and to determine uh, who can speak to whom and how it should be connected. Uh, this also then allows you to proactively run risk analysis uh, for any potential changes that will come up, and that will allow you to achieve, as I referred to earlier, this continuous compliance. So we see this as an effective way to meet uh, that particular article in uh, GDPR. Next up, uh, as mentioned, records of processing activities. And so in this area, you have to have some way to record uh, that uh, – any activities that you're doing that have to do with personal data, that you have uh, a way that somebody could call it up uh, if requested, and you can demonstrate how you've protected that data and who's had access to it. Uh, one area in which um, uh, we provide a solution is the ability to monitor changes to the firewall. So if we look at uh, changes that have been requested, uh, implemented, and how they've been implemented, uh, we record all of this information. And uh, as said before, we're doing the analysis to ensure that it complies with uh, risk um, policies that are in place. And so once it comes time to uh, have an audit, we can then run com uh, comprehensive audit reports across all of your vendors and platforms. So you have it all in one place. So uh, if you did have um, uh, the supervisory authority uh, request uh, such a document, you have it easily at your fingertips. Next up. Uh, Article 32, uh, the security of processing. We talked about uh, ongoing confidentiality, the CIA, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and resilience of uh, processing systems and servers. So how we do this is uh, we're providing a very detailed uh, topology mapping of your network so that you can identify and see whether there are any security violations or misconfigurations that could put you at risk. Uh, you can then identify and remove any rules that may no longer be in use or redundant or uh, extraneous. Uh, and take a look at overall, uh, are you uh, having too much access provided to a certain area? And you can limit that access uh, by, providing, or by conducting uh, the proactive risk analysis that I referred to earlier. Ultimately, this will ensure that you have business-critical connectivity uh, and you can analyze uh, through the detailed topology that that continues to be maintained. And if for whatever reason uh, something breaks down, you'll have visibility into it and more particularly have visibility into how it could be uh, repaired in a timely manner. So uh, this really addressing the, the timely manner and event of physical or technical incident, this last bullet point, uh, providing the business critical connectivity and visibility into it uh, is a key way in which you can continue to maintain that and comply with GDPR. And uh, next up, uh, finally, uh, data protection impact assessments. Okay, so when it comes down to understanding uh, what is the ultimate impact uh, going to be and how can I safeguard myself, um, it's ultimately what we're providing is a, a simple uh, 
as I said, one uh, central console, single pane of glass way in which you can manage all of your firewall policies, ensure that you have the correct security measures in place, ensure that you are in compliance with uh, the policies that have been dictated now by GDPR, and uh, make certain that uh, you can demonstrate that you are, in fact, uh, protecting this personal data uh, and show that to any regulator that uh, would look into it. Um, you can do this in a way that is going to reduce the effort associated with it, and it's also going to reduce the time necessary in order to prepare these things. Uh, all uh, across, uh, as I said before, very uh, complex and uh, wide-ranging uh, network solutions. So to summarize uh, how we're really helping uh, organizations prepare for uh, next year's implementation of GDPR, um, I'd like to build from the bottom up. Uh, first and foremost, we're providing visibility and control across your broad network. Uh, you can't manage what you can't see, and so uh, the ability to kind of give that visibility in one uh, centralized console area uh, allows you to kind of get your hands around the problem first. Uh, Real-time change monitoring and reporting, this goes to the continuous compliance point that I've been making. So the ability to, in real time, uh, understand how the change uh, needs to uh, be implemented in order to maintain compliance with the policies that you've put in place, and also tracking those changes so that you can report at time of audit. Uh, defining and enforcing a central uh, security policy, it really does come down to the organizations defining what the policy is, but as I demonstrated uh, in the uh, USP, you can see how uh, you can demonstrate that in a very simple diagram uh, and have that available for authorities to show that you do indeed have uh, an overall security policy and that you're able to implement it effectively. Um, Connectivity analysis and uh, troubleshooting, uh, as I mentioned, the ability to kind of gain uh, insights into whether or not your systems are up and running and being maintained, and if in the event that there is some sort of failure, having visibility into that very quickly so you can resolve it. And ultimately, this uh, goes to the goal that uh, we have for all organizations, and that is policy-based automation as it relates to their ability to manage risk uh, and uh, we do so by providing proactive risk analysis and automating uh, decommissioning of rules uh, and the ability to manage those rules. So that was just a, a quick overview of uh, what we're providing to organizations, in this case to uh, address uh, GDPR, uh, but also you know, we've used it effectively to provide continuous compliance and audit readiness uh, as it relates to a list of uh, uh, regulations that are out there, as you can see here. So with that, uh, I'll send it back to you, Jonathan, to talk about some of the resources that you had referred to earlier, but uh, maybe specifically you can call them out, uh, that are available to people that are going to look to uh, set up uh, uh, their ability to comply with GDPR. Oh. Do we have Jonathan there? So, well, can well, you hear me? Yeah, yeah no, we can. Yeah. yeah. Can Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, let me whiz through the resources. Probably a good time if you've got questions to hit the questions tab in the, uh, that you can see at the top of the screen there. But there are some resources in these links. There's some FAQs. There's a short film which summarizes some of the things that we've talked about. And there are some details on a, um, on a more detailed service that we have on information about GDPR and then some links to Right to be Forgotten, etc. And I guess that leaves us, may I, if there are any questions for uh, Pat or me, then we're really happy to take them. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Pat. So, uh, everyone, if you have any questions for Jonathan about GDPR, about maybe how it applies to you, or maybe any, um, any clarifications uh, that you would like to get from him, that now is the, the time to do that. You can click the Questions button and just enter your question. And we'll be happy to take, uh, to take your questions. Also, if you have a question for Pat on um, continuous compliance and how you can achieve continuous compliance with 
the two phenol orchestration suites, then of course you're welcome to um, to enter your question. So, Jonathan, I wanted to ask. I know that in, in the previous conversation we talked a little bit about, um, you know, what what happens when an organization has a distributed environment and they have, you know, different security systems that they use for um, either for network security or for identity management. Uh, and you mentioned a, a challenge around that, around um, you know, reviewing all these different systems. Can you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think from my experience, and um, bluntly, when you're in the room dealing with a breach, it tends to get pretty ugly. I think people have a lack of information oftentimes. Uh, people often don't want to make decisions. Often, if you're a listed entity particularly, the breach team might be led by the senior non-executive director who might be a non-digital native, you know, typically 70-year-old white male. So you're having to explain technology as you go almost. So that's why I think solutions that enable you to, you know, to show how your protection, you know, was compromised or what worked and what didn't work are really key. And as you say, many of us are in a very... Um, a diverse model, really, that we produce what we produce. You know, even a simple law firm like ours, we rely on different uh, systems to do different things for our clients. We rely on different vendors, you know, different uh, law firms who provide services for us in different jurisdictions. So that visibility thing, I think, gets gets critical as a result. So any sort of system that can help you understand where your defenses are and where, uh, where your threats are, I, I think helps, helps enormously. And as I say, you're going to have to do all of that in 72 hours, probably actually less, because in many cases you don't recognize a breach for being a breach until after the clock started ticking. Okay, we do have uh, a few questions that came in. Um, Jonathan, can you can you see the questions that came in? I can. There's a good one here. Many organisations are seeking more specific guidance on compliance with GDPR. I understand GDPR is a principles-based regulation, and uh, as such detailed compliance guidance is not necessarily going to be issued. I think that's a really good question. I think the issue there is that many people are saying, oh, I'm going to wait till the guidance before I start. Well, in many areas, we're not going to get guidance at all. Most of the guidance that will apply across Europe is coming from the Article 29 Working Party. I think they're more or less behind with their program of work already, and their program of work only covers... Uh, uh, covers up, up until the end of 2017. So we do have some guidance out on data portability and a couple of other areas. But the other thing to say, of course, is that regulators can only give guidance. They can't determine what the law is. And <coughs> in many of these areas, we're not going to get solid guidance from courts until maybe 2023, 2024, because the domestic courts are likely to refer issues to the European Court uh, of Justice where there's a long waiting list, maybe 18 months or so. So if you're waiting for guidance, I, I think you are in difficulty. Uh, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think that's the role of you know, lawyers who have 20-odd years' experience in this space because we know the pressure points from a lot of regulators. We know that they're going to worry about things like health data, uh, things like uh, stuff that's on children or gets uh, in a B2C environment. So I think that has to influence your decisions and how you behave. And areas like DPIAs, of course, you've got to put a process in place now because you've got to learn it and get good at it before May 2018. 
I can answer one that's there quickly if you want me to, Maya. What's the difference between a data controller and a data processor? Well, basically, a data controller is the organization, more or less, that owns the data, that directs how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to be used. And a data processor usually is, if you like, the servant to that data controller. This is obviously very complex these days because of the way in which we do business, this disaggregated nature. So, for example, most major corporations don't ever book flights or hotels internally. So you can get a situation where two businesses are both data controllers. Um, if you need to know more on that, there's a glossary on our website. So if you go to cordycompliance.com, uh, glossary in the top right-hand box, you'll, you'll get a glossary that will help you with those definitions. I think we may Pat, have time already... to, uh, one more question, um, and for the, the other questions, we can uh, follow up with you, um, with people who asked, we can follow up with you and provide an answer. I'm afraid we're, uh, we are out of time, so I think we have time just for one more. Uh... Unless there are any you fancy, Pat, there's another one there that's basically saying, if I have a mailing list now, how can I get it to comply in a post-GDPR world? Now, that's a real challenge. We have two regulatory actions against Honda and Flybe uh, recently from the UK Data Protection Regulator. So you can't breach an existing law to comply with a law that's coming in. In this case, Flybe of regional airline try to clean up their database for GDPR coming in by what's called an incentivized opt-in campaign. So saying to people, you know, rejoin and you, we'll put you in a prize draw to win a flight. Common marketing practice, uh, data protection regulator under the existing rules uh, how, take, took action against Flybe and fined them for that. So simple thing to say is it's a challenging area. You do need to clean up your database. Obviously, data that you don't need, destroy. Many people, for example, have a lot of students on their database and they don't market to them. That's just wasting time and money. So clean up your database, but make sure that you comply with the existing laws, not only data protection laws, but marketing laws uh, w when you're doing that cleanup. Maya, I think we're out of time, so I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you, Jonathan. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Jonathan, for your insights and for the introduction to GDPR. And thank you, Pat, for uh, co-presenting today. Um, the webinar is, of course, uh, recorded. So uh, you, can, uh, you can go back to Bright Talk and listen to it. Uh, if you need more clarification or if you need us to, if you need to repeat any of the slides, um, and for the questions that we didn't get to, we will, we will follow up with you with the answers. So thank you everyone for joining today. You do have an attachment there that you can download and please uh, make sure you rate this webinar for us. Thanks again and have a great day.